May be seated. Thanks, guys. Praise the Lord. It is from the inside out. I mean, to me, people trying to live their lives the other way, from the outside in, and life never brings any satisfaction when you try to live it the way that's the opposite than what it was intended. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We gather today. One of the things we we'll begin our services with, as we we'll begin our preaching portion of the service, is an ordination of a couple of gentlemen will be a part of our elders team. We at Believers Fellowship, uh, our church is an elder-driven church, which means that. Uh, we have men whom the Lord has ordained and set forth for this purpose to give guidance and direction and leadership, of course, under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're blessed in our church to have so many godly men that we do our elders on a rotation basis. You serve for two to three years and you rotate, someone else can come in. And then after the rotation period, you're allowed to be a part of it again. But God has really blessed us with some men who love Jesus, committed to Christ, committed to the bride of Christ, and we certainly appreciate that ministry that they have. Uh, be uh, Brother Lenny Zahn and Don Hite, once you come, and uh, as they come before you today, these two men that uh, the church has set forth and set aside to be a part of our elders. As they come and stand here just for a moment, those who come to pray with them can gather behind them. And I want to read you as a, just as a word to you gentlemen, uh, specifically, I believe a strong charge from the scriptures says, I, from second, first Peter chapter four, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says, I exhort you, the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders and all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. It's a great ministry that you've been chosen to be a part of, and the church has selected you, and you have come to a place to commit to this ministry. So those you have selected to gather around you to pray are going to begin to pray over you now. So if you gentlemen would just kneel while those who are praying over you would come. Lay hands on you as a, you've been directed there and pray for these gentlemen. And as they're doing that, let me say that while they pray, that you as a church, not only pray today in just a moment, we'll all pray together, but I pray that you would put these, the whole elders council on your church prayer list and be praying for them monthly, weekly, daily as the Lord leads you to pray because it is an important ministry that God has given to the charge of these men to give wisdom and direction and guidance to this church and to the staff and to, Lord, to the Lord's bride, the body of Christ. So it's a very important and a very honorable place that you come to. But more important than an exaltation, it's a place of servanthood. That's why the Bible calls for humility. The Bible says it's a good thing should one desire this ministry. It's also an important responsibility. So it's important that we as a body pray for these men because we as a church, especially in the days that we're living in, need continued guidance, and continued wisdom, and continued counsel. So let's trust the Lord for their lives and for their families. As these men are being prayed for, I'd ask you to bow your head. And you would just worship the Lord and offer a prayer of encouragement, a prayer of thanksgiving for these lives, but also that God would give them grace and strength. So as they're being prayed for, would you just now take a moment to personally pray one at a time for them?
Father, we thank you and we bless your name today and realize that any time that you would lay your hand on any of us for any specific task, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to bring glory to your name. Lord, you've delegated in your word a way of administration and leadership for the body of Christ through the ministry of the elder. And Lord, we believe what you teach in Scripture. And it's our heart's desire as a church that we line up everything that we're doing with the Word of God. So, Father, as you see our hearts desiring to be submissive and obedient to your truth and your Word, give us guidance. And Lord, as these men commit themselves to serve you and to serve this body, would you grace their lives with strength, with wisdom, with courage, discernment. God, that the steps that they take in the days that are ahead of them would be guided solely by your Holy Spirit. We would find ourselves, Lord, uh, surrounded and just literally engrossed in your, in your will and your purposes for our lives. God, help us to remove personal preferences and personal desire and personal design out of the picture completely. Subject ourselves fully, totally, and only to your will. I pray not only for these two men coming in, being ordained as elders, but for the whole elder council, Father, that we'd continue to hear your voice. If there's anything that would be a hindrance in any individual life, that you would clarify that, that we might commit it, repent, surrender, and yield totally our hearts to you. So as these men are presented today and these hands are being laid upon them, Lord, I pray you'd bless them, guard them, guide them, help them to walk in the humility that you call us to in your truth. We bless your precious name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. These gentlemen are going to come and sign this ordination certificate real briefly, and then uh, once you sign that, you can be seated. But let's give a, a hand of encouragement to these gentlemen who come today and committed their life to this ministry. Don and Brother Lenny, if you'll stay just for a moment, we'll present you these ordination certificates. Praise the Lord. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming, being supportive to these men and lifting them up and encouraging them. I know they appreciate it as well. Don Hyde, let me present you this. Thank you, brother, for your service to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you. You too, brother Lenny. We love you and praise God for you, brother. God bless you. Thank you, gentlemen. Give them another praise the Lord. Amen. The elders have been a constant source of encouragement to me, and I certainly appreciate the ministry that they've committed themselves to in the body of Christ. We're continuing this morning with our series of messages on sync. All right, and although this is a topical series, many times what we'll do is, even if we do a topic, we do something expositional with it. But it is an important series, especially as we've been looking at the beginning of the year, getting everything in order. The Bible talks about the one who orders his steps properly. Well, the way you do that is you order your steps according to the Word of God. But let me just say, and as I preface this today, as we've talked about the idea of synchronization and getting our lives in sync with the will of God, you know, and understanding that terminology is, is very important. But literally, the word to sync comes from synchronize, which means to, to move on or to operate, to work at the same rate and exactly together. That's called walking in the will of God for us that are believers, amen. It's another word, definition was to cause sound and action to match precisely. Now you've seen the videos perhaps of somebody's match, doesn't, the words don't match to what the mouth's doing and how frustrating that is. But let me say in your Christian life, the words which we operate our lives by ought to be the Word of God. The Bible says, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. So our mouth is only reacting precisely with what the Father's Word is for our life. And the obvious definition means to occur at the same time or coincide and agree in time. That's what our Christian life really is. Now, we talked about in the beginning of this, your life will never be in sync until you get in the right relationship with God. Only one way to do that, and that's through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, surrendering your heart and your life to Him, receiving the precious blood as your offering for your sin and your salvation. Jesus Christ died that you might become a new person. And in that first message, we talked about the difference between that which is genuine and that which is counterfeit. We talked about that to some degree. Also, the second message, we dealt with getting the latest update. 
which is important in your Christian life as well. Now, with my phone and having to sync it, it's always important I have it's up to date because one, one calendar may be different from another calendar or an appointment from another appointment, so I try to keep them in sync. I went and bought my wife's Christmas present because they wouldn't let us have the renewal price until January, so she got a coupon for one of her gifts at Christmas, which was for a new iPhone. And uh, they told me at the iPhone store when I picked it out, I said, okay, just go home. You can just put it in, your, you know, in the cradle, hook it up, and it'll sync. Everything will be fine. We don't do anything. Just say click, 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 click. And two hours later, I'm still looking at technical manuals and clicking through it. We finally got her synchronized and got her updated. But it's important in our Christian life. And we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to keep us updated, to keep us in tune with the Father. God gave us the precious Holy Spirit in these vessels. We became the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, who lives in us and who resides in us. And that second message, I, I, probably one of the most important messages we preached this year, I believe, is on, is, it had to do with grieving the Holy Spirit and how Christians grieve the Spirit of God. Today's message is called Getting All Your Apps Updated. And there are applications in our life that I'm talking about. There's family, there's relationships, there's job, career, friendships, time, money. All those things are important that we are listening to what God has to say. I, I don't guess I'm ever surprised anymore to, to see how many people in churches today going under the banner of Christian uh, and, and saying they love Jesus, but at the same time, their lives are so out of sync and so out of order because they're not obeying the Word of God. They're not seeing what the Bible has to say and making the application of Scripture to their life. So what I want to do today is, is talk about an application that's very important and really it deals with one specific, perhaps, area in our life, and that's in our relationship, in our marriage. But I will say that if you can grasp the heart of this message, I, it doesn't matter if you're here a single person or a married person, if you can get the heartbeat of what Pastor Joe is preaching on today and teaching on today, it'll revolutionize your life you say, how do you know? Because it revolutionized my life. And not only is it an important message about being, being in tune with the Father and having the deepest needs of our life met by Him, it's, it's a message that will be a life-changing message within a marriage, within a job, within a career, anywhere you're walking in your life, perhaps especially where you may be suffering or having disappointments or frustrations or experiencing some emotional or mental fatigue in your life or physical fatigue, uh, it, this, is the, this is a message that you just need to embrace today. And I would say, uh, you, when you really look at the heart of it and the context of it, it's, it's not something we haven't preached before, but I, I want to present it in a way today I think that will uh, give some more clarity to your life and even especially in the applications of your life. And at first glance, uh, with the verses I share with you may not seem relevant to what I want to talk about because... The heart of it is the deeper needs of our life, and especially in our marriage and, and relationships. So I want to look at this, this third part of this message, and it has to do with getting your marriage, your life, and your relationships in sync with the Holy Father. Because here today, I can guarantee you that if your marriage especially is not in sync with God's will and God's purposes, then your marriage is not on the rock, it's on the rocks. And it will soon be sitting like a carnival cruise line off the coast of Italy. I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. Amen? Let me give you a couple of scriptures that may not even seem pertinent to marriage or the relationship, but they are, and I'll explain them and give you all three of them first. It says, For they drank of the rock, that spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now Paul's talking to the Corinthians about the journey of the children of Israel through the wilderness and how that God satisfied the deep need, the thirst they had. They're dying in the wilderness. You have to have water. You have to have bread. There has to be sustenance. He said, God met their deepest need for water in the wilderness. And then in John 7, Jesus stood up on the last day of the feast. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within. Drink from me and something's going to happen. And then in John chapter 6, chapter before this, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And you say, what does that have to do with marriage and relationships and these other issues? It has everything in the world to do with it. Let me put it this way. He is saying here that it is Jesus Christ, that God's only Son, is the one who has been sent to meet your deepest needs. Your deepest needs. That is Christ the Lord. In fact, I might even go on by asking this particular question. Who is it you look to to meet your deepest needs in life? 
And maybe we need to define what those deepest needs are. But we're not talking about the physical needs like oxygen and sleep and air, food to breathe. Those are genuine physical needs in our life. But I'm talking about something on a deeper level of our heart. And every person, just as we have an appetite, in fact, literally there's a craving in our life to drink and to eat so as to sustain our physical life. God put that in us, all right? There's also some needs that are in us that I believe God placed within us so that we would seek to have them satisfied. Unfortunately, most people seek to have those needs satisfied in all the wrong places and by all the wrong means. But they're legitimate needs that are in our life. And we've talked about, as I said, some of these things in the past and other services and other means and methods. But let's look at what the four basic needs that all human beings are instinctively motiv motivated to satisfy all their lives, all right? First one is acceptance. And we'll talk about each of these in a moment. Second is identity. So always search for the identity. Another is security. And the last one has to do with purpose. And these are strong, and I believe the strongest of these is acceptance, that strong taproot drive in the heart of every being that God put there, and he put it there so that you would realize that he's the only one who can satisfy and fulfill it. This is the thing that drives the teenager to want to be popular, to be accepted. This is the thing that drives the, the man to want to succeed in his career. But literally it gets down to this acceptance of knowing that you are loved or knowing that you are needed by somebody else or by others. The issue of identity has to do with knowing that you are individually significant, that you have a special purpose, you have a special reason, that your life means something. People are desiring that. It's a deep-rooted need. Security is the third, knowing that you're well protected, you're well provided for. The fourth deep need of our life is purpose, knowing that you have a reason for living. Now, as Christians, we know that God gives us purpose, that we can know the will of God, and that God has a plan for our life that's greater than anything that I can determine for myself. It's better than anything that the world can supply for me. But all these are, are, are driven, are driving needs within every one of us, and each of us, whether we're willing to admit or not, are seeking to satisfy those appetites just as much as we would seek to say, I'm thirsty, I need something to drink, or I'm going to die, and so I look for something to drink. I believe we're strongly driven. I believe we're driven physically. I believe we're driven emotionally to, to find just the right thing to satisfy these particular needs. Deep needs, real needs. You say, well, I don't have them, then you're lying. All right, because we all have it. The Bible talks about these. This is not psychobabble, all right, or some kind of twist of psychology to try to Christianize it, all right? This is true. These are actual, real needs that we all face. And I personally believe God placed these there in our lives for a reason, all right? It's that thing that there's something about us that all reaches out to and longs for. And, and, and we all seek to meet them. Unfortunately, we all seek to meet them until we meet Christ in the wrong way. In fact, let me give you a list of some things, and there's no particular order for these things, a way, of, of the ways people look to satisfy the needs of the heart and the soul, not the needs of the flesh, all right? Their self, them, many times they look to themselves, I, I'm my own person, a spouse, children, friends, uh, employer, or work, jobs, careers, church, pastors, parents, sometimes God, money, material possessions, or a combination of several of these things. If I can just have this. How many times you thought in your own life, if this would just happen or if that would just take place or if this person would recognize me or if I could just reach this state on my job or this status in the community, then I'd really be happy. Only perhaps to find what you thought would meet your need doesn't really meet your need. And that, th that's the question I want to ask you today. Who is it in your life that you look to to meet the deepest needs of your heart and life? I mean, in everyday life, whom, who is it you look to to fulfill the needs for acceptance? the need for identity, the need for security, the need for purpose. A lot of people never find it. Now, I know most Christians voluntarily quickly say, well, you know, I, I seek God first and more than anyone else or any, anything in my life. I'm looking to God to meet my deepest need. Most people cannot say that. In fact, a lot of Christians who do, do say it don't understand what they're saying because even though they know that in their head, they're still trying to look to someone, some situation or some event to bring substance to their life so that out of their innermost being flows rivers of living water. Out of their being, in their heart, there's peace. There's genuine satisfaction. In fact, there's a lot of people, you know, that just don't get a grip on what it really means when Jesus said, I've come to give you a drink that'll, that you'll never really thirst again. I've come to give you a drink that after you drink this, life will flow from you enough for you and enough to meet the needs of other people around you. Happens all the time, especially in marriage. She thinks, or he thinks, 
I'm going to marry this person and everything's going to be perfect. He's Prince Charming, and she's Prince is Wonderful, and once we get together, things are not going to be any better in life. I mean, you see the movies, you, you read the fairy tales, all the things. If, I, if just Prince Char Charming comes and wakes me out of the dead slumber of my life by giving me the kiss, and I'll rise and marry, and we'll ride off on his little white horse, and we'll be happy ever after. Only to discover about three days later, his horse is crippled. <laughs> Only after a little while you find out that he was holding his stomach in. <laughs> his hair is falling out. He's not at all what you thought he would be. You thought he was going to change your life. You thought things were going to be better. He thought things would be different. But I want you to know, even though in marriage you can meet a lot of needs in each other's lives, they never, those needs are never really satisfied. The deeper needs of your life will never be satisfied by anything other than a personal, deep, real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's just the truth of scriptures. So the first thing you need to understand in order for your life to work out, your marriage to work out, if you're sitting here as a single person, the first thing you need to un understand is this. First and foremost, no human being can meet your deepest needs. Only God can. It bears repeating. We've written it on the wall. No human being can meet your deepest needs. Only God can. And for those of you who are still searching down one dead-end alley after another, sticking your nose in every corner you can, thinking, if I go there, I'll find life. If I do this, I'll have peace. If I do this, there'll be joy. If I marry him, it'll be great. If I marry her, my life will be full. Only discover that nobody can meet your deepest needs. God didn't make you that way. He made you so that only he and he ultimately can be the one that you experience genuine life and have your real needs met in. That's because he wants you to know him. That's because he wants you to experience his life. A lot of marriages end up in delusion. A lot of marriages end up in divorce because the people that are involved in the relationship, they come in with some unrealistic expectation. And it's not because they're an evil people or they're irresponsible people. It's just because they're not understanding people. They think that another person is going to be the, be the one who meets the deepest needs of their heart and life. Every person who gets married, I guarantee you, on some level comes into the relationship just that way. But when you as a child of God, or even as an individual, when you come to the place in your life, when you're expecting someone else, something else, to meet your deepest needs, you automatically are making some mistakes in your life. You're automatically transferring the expectations for fulfillment to the closest person or resource that's near you and they don't have the capacity to meet that particular need in your life. It's important that we realize the one who does meet the particular needs of our heart and life. When the expectation of having your deep needs meet is transferred to someone else or something else that is not God, there's three main problems you're gonna incur. And it could well be today that as you listen to this message, you're gonna see what those problems are in your heart and life. You're gonna discover something unique about your heart saying, I was not looking to God to meet the need of my life. I was looking to drugs. I was looking to man. I was looking to a woman. I was looking to money. I was looking to prosperity. And you find out there's some problems. Well, what are the problems that are created first and foremost? Well, it's this one. Number one, you're always going to be disappointed with the results. No matter if things can seem to go perfect. Because they're superficial. Great song to end the worship time with. Living my life from the inside out mentality. Too many people are doing just what we're talking about, trying to think something on the outside is going to meet the deeper need on the inside. That doesn't happen. Only God can meet the deep needs on the inside. No matter what age you're at, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what your relationships are, single, married, divorced, or whatever, only God is going to meet the deepest needs of your heart and life. The second thing you need to understand, you will lack yourself the personal resources that you need to love others the way you should be loving them and to confront life with success. Why? Because you're not getting what you need to live. How can I love you if I don't have a resource to draw from? Within my flesh, the Bible says there's no good thing. I don't have the capacity. In fact, most of you who say you're in love or fell in love today, if you'll get honest about it, you'll see that that relationship began not really with love, but more with, let's put it this way, desire or something desirable about the person. It might have been their looks, it might have been the way they treated you, it might have been their personality, such as in my place, my wonderful charm and wit. Or, but whatever it was, you know, uh, it, it was selfish on your part. You liked them. Why did you like them? Well, they liked me. 
That's, that's why I like them. They accepted me. That's why I like There was something there that, that it was about, reality is about you. Amen? I like them. They make me feel good. I like being around them. They're funny. They make me laugh. I, I like them. Well, what's it doing? Well, it's all about me then. Genuine love begins when it steps out of you and says, no matter if they laugh, no matter if they cry, no matter what they say, no matter where they're encouraging, whether they're not encouraging, no matter where they look good, look bad, I'm going to love them anyway. And how can I do that? Now, because my, I'm getting satisfied from the inside and my relationship with Christ, I have the resources to be the kind of lover I need to be. Love is not about getting, it's about giving. God so loved the world that he gave. There's the premise for it all, genuine love. I don't have that kind of love until I come to Christ. Romans 5 says that the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God gives me what I need to be the love er that I need to be. But it's not going to come from people. They're limited. I'm limited. And I can't find life until I deal with my relationship with God. The third point that comes in this in, in difficulty is that you almost will always be hurt and offended eventually by the one whom you have invested your trust in because that one cannot properly meet your deepest needs. You may be trying to minister to them, encourage them, love them, sacrifice for them, but hey, if you're not looking to God to meet your deepest needs, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be walking around saying, I just thought it would be better than this. I thought he would be more than that. I thought she would be more than that. I, I'm, I, will I ever be happy? Is this ever going to work out? Why, why did I, I must have made a mistake. I, maybe I married the wrong person. And on and on the stupid questions and the stupid statements come. You know why they come? They're because we've been looking to people to do what only God can do. We've been looking for situations to do what only God can do. We've been looking for career to do what only God can do. How many people do you know that have reached the apex in their life, the top of the ladder, the top of the shelf, and they're the most miserable people in life? When they're standing there, well, I thought I was going to be happy. Most often, you know, the reaction to the problems is a, is a, is a, is a frustration. It's manageable, perhaps, for a little bit of time, but then it turns into outward anger, and then that's totally destructive in the relationship. It's a trap you fall into if you're not careful. And what happens when you fall into the stress? Well, God tells us there's dangers by putting our trust and putting our faith in others first and foremost over Him. All right? Here's what happens. The Bible says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. It's pretty simple, isn't it? If you're putting your trust in yourself instead of God, well, that's foolish. That's foolish. Another scripture in, in Jeremiah says, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. In other words, if you're putting yourself... And putting your trust in people or in yourself or your own strength or your own ability. I can deal with this. I'm a man. All that stuff. You're cursed. That's a hard statement, is it not? Cursed is the man, the woman who does that. There's another verse that's appropriate to this. It says, he who trusts in his riches will fall. If you put your trust in money, you're, you're headed for trouble. So you got a fool. You got cursed. You got failure. <laughs> I don't want that to be the description marks of my life. Do you? Do you want those to be the earmarks of your life? Certainly not. Now, there's nothing wrong with riches. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with prosperity. There's nothing wrong with blessing. And there's nothing wrong with wisdom. But ultimately, all those things come from the Lord. You know, I remember psychologists years ago put out a statement that talked about the three things that men, men, people in general, want. It was wealth, health, and prosperity is what it really got down to. Respect. All right? They wanted to be liked by people. They wanted to be accepted by people. They wanted money, and they wanted healthy, long life. That's what people look for in life most of all. But you st study scriptures, and the Bible says there's only one place to find the kind of fullness of life you're looking for, and that's to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, in a relationship with God. Now, if you compare that, on the other hand, with the promises that God makes to the people who would put their trust in Him and say, I'm going to look to God to satisfy the deepest needs of my life. Well, the Scripture says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. What's he saying here? If you're going to put your faith, your hope, your trust in God first and foremost and look to Him to be the one who satisfies the deepest needs of your life, then He says to you, you're going to be like a tree planted by a river. Now, I don't know if you looked around here lately, but I've read reports about how 
millions upon millions of trees are dying all around Texas because of the extended drought that we're in. Even recently, you look in the neighborhoods, they're putting up extended water regulations. You say, well, we have water regulations. We got, got rain. Hey, we're still 28 inches behind where we need to be. And what's happening? When you drive down the communities and through the streets and in the neighborhoods, you see trees dying everywhere. Just all over the place, dead trees. Well, it's winter. No, you'll notice the ones that are dead. Hey, so how do you tell the difference between just a winterized tree and a dead tree? The dead trees still have their leaves on them, but they're dead leaves. The winterized trees have dropped all their leaves. They've pushed them off. So you see all these trees with all the dead leaves hanging off them? Those are going to have to come down on your house or in your yard. It's your choice. <laughs> They're going to have to come down. Why? There's no, there's no sustenance for them. And the Bible says the person who looks to have his needs met by anything else other than God is like that tree. It's hanging there with dead leaves. There's no fruit. There's no life. You may be going through a season, but you're still alive if you look to God for tr and put your faith and you trust him. You may go through a cold year. You may go through a cold season, but there's still life inside you. And fruit will appear in due season and due time. The Bible says we will, we will receive if we faint not. God, God's presence is still the sustaining force. But all these other trees by the millions are going to have to come down. Rotten, dead. But have you noticed when you go by those places that are still by the lakes that have water in them, or the ponds or the streams or the creek beds, those trees are doing very well. Because there's a source that they can draw from that's not limited. We have a source, praise God, that is not limited, that we can draw from. And if you're frustrated and if you're irritated, then you need to say, you need to take the time to say, why is all this frustration in my life or in my marriage, in my home, in my heart? Where's all this coming from? You look at the promises of God when the scripture says in Psalms 125, 1, those whose trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but it abides forever. That's a pretty strong promise. There's another one from Proverbs 29. He who trusts in the Lord will be exalted, be blessed. Be encouraged. You'll be strengthened. You'll have what you need when you need it because you're not looking to someone else to meet the need of your life. Now, you look at those scriptures and those two passages. There's some very clear, understandable contrast between those two things. They're unmistakable. If I'm drawing upon the Lord, God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, to be the source, or am I looking to someone, something, or the world, or material things to be the source, what's the difference? Well, foolish cursed, failure, or blessed, graced, and exalted. When you trust in people or things, several things. One, your inner security is now dependent upon someone or something that you cannot predict and you cannot control and whose resources to meet your needs are extremely limited. If you're looking to a man to meet your needs or a woman to meet your needs, I hope you have a great relationship, but you won't have one until you look first and foremost for God to meet your needs in that relationship. Because there are places, ma'am and sir, that you're both going to walk in this life. There's going to be some crisis moments, there's going to be some dark days, and there's going to be some difficult days that you do not have the resources, much less to meet your own need in, much less your spouse's need in. And you're going to discover in those times, and you should be discovering, that God's going to walk me through this. God's going to be the strength and the source. He's going to be my strong and mighty tower. He's going to be my defender. I can deal with this because his resources are not limited. The people's are. Another problem that occurs when you trust in people or things is your ability to give from yourself is dependent upon your ability to give from others. You're not getting it from the Lord, and you've got to have a resource for what you're giving out, and your flesh, the Bible says, will fail. And if you trust your flesh, then you're not going to experience the grace of God. So you're not going to be able to be the lover, the giver, the concerned one, the encouraging one, unless you have a well which you're drawing from. You understand this? Now, folks, this is the most profound sermon you're going to hear this year. <laughs> to put it simply, and it is such a simple word. It is such a simple truth, but we so easily overlook it in our life. The Bible tells us our life is supposed to be filled with grace and abundance, but we don't experience it. Because why? We're trusting in things. Our life is filled with an atmosphere of disappointment and frustration. And we're just thinking, if he would ever change, if she would ever get right, if she'd ever quit doing that, if my kids would do this, if my boss would do that, and we're just frustrated. And there's tension. And we're filled with tension. How can we meet a need in anybody else? We can't even meet a need in our own life. It's just not going to happen. Frustration. And then there's this unrealistic unrealist expectation 
that you have of others, that begins to create a negative atmosphere of tension in your relationships. And it becomes like a force field repelling people that are around you. It, it drives them away instead of attracting new people to you. And there's nothing more distracting than thinking that someone's going to meet my need and they don't meet my need and I become unhappy. I remember sitting down with a young man in ministry one time and I knew he was looking to me to meet all his needs as a, as a young minister. Early days of our, our church ministry. And I finally said, I said, two things here. Number one, I'm not your father and I'm not your God. I can't meet those needs in your life. And if you look to me, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Just ask Kathy. <laughs> Amen? Just ask. You know, because I'm limited. And if you put your trust in church or people, well, those people, those sorry people, church, what, why are you trusting people at church for? We trust the Lord. We put our faith. We believe in Him. That's why when somebody blows it, it doesn't ruin our life. It doesn't shake our world. I know that uh, you may not be experiencing anything in your life right now, but I believe God puts us in situations where we have to learn and determine that He is our source of strength, and no one else is. No one else is but Him. And ultimately, when we learn that lesson, it becomes a lesson of grace, and it becomes a lesson of, of glory in our life. Let me tell you what happens, though, when you trust people or things, all right? And when you're looking to someone else to meet a need in your life, it boils down to this. It is idolatry. It's idolatry. God said, you have no other gods before me. And when you look to anyone or anything to meet your need before you look to God to meet your need, that's idol worship. And it may be an individual, it may be a, an idea, maybe some expectation, but it literally boils down to this. You're, you're inviting a curse and not the blessings of God on your life. It is idolatry. And I tell you, I've gone through some times in my heart, my own life, where God had to literally rebuke me for this. I, I remember a time when we first moved in the building over here, and, and there were some tensions within the body of Christ, and people were saying stuff about me, and it wasn't true. I mean, I mean, there's plenty of stuff to say that is true. Why make up something, all right? And, and, and there was tension, and, and some, somebody in the, in the church was even fabricating documents with state st seals and stamps on them, and then changing the documents to look like I had forged a bunch of materials and all the materials of the church belonged to me. I mean, they were just bald-faced lies. I was mad. I mean, I've, I've worked pretty hard on protecting my integrity and my reputation. It's a serious thing with me, all right? And so I'm frustrated and I'm ticked up and I can't sleep. I'm praying, getting nowhere. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm probably causing everybody in my life to be miserable, you know? And I've got my head down. Then I will add it. I've served you, God. And God just kind of pulls you aside and says, That's idolatry, son. You put your pride out there, your arrogance. Doesn't matter, you know, if people lie about you. Doesn't matter. If your heart is right with me, you have peace. Doesn't matter if people don't like you. Now, most of us, without confessing it, will agree. Ninety-nine, at least nine-tenths of us will agree. Or other we still are lying about it. We like people to like us. Why? It's that first taproot, strong drive of the soul. It's that acceptance. We want to be liked. I want to be liked by you. That's why sometimes when the Lord gives me a message to preach to the church, I say, nobody's going to like me. <laughs> You know, and, but when you find out that you, it doesn't matter, you, you, Jesus likes you. That's all that matters. Amen. It really is. It's, and, and you may not believe that. You say, well, it's more important. There's nothing more important than Jesus loving and blessing and accepting. The Bible says in Colossians, we are accepted in the beloved. <laughs> I mean, but why, we, why do we get so frustrated? Why do, we get, why do we lose sleep? Why do we get so stressed out in our marriage? Why do you get mad in traffic? I mean, I'd get the same guy in front of me. He's doing 20 and a 35. And the guy next to him is having a race with him. <laughs> so you can't get out and you're stuck. You know, what good is it to sit there and get mad? I mean, really, what are you saying? You know, I'd be happier if everybody go drive like I drive. We'd probably have a lot more wrecks, but anyway. <laughs> I'd be happy if everybody acted the way I act. If everybody acted the way you act, we'd be in bigger trouble. Amen? But, you know, <laughs> Kathy just sits over there and... Pats me on the leg. And I have to stop and realize how stupid and childish and immature. Them getting in the way or out of the way doesn't make any difference. 
They're going to turn off in a minute. Chill out. You know, or probably die at the wheel. <laughs> it's okay. But, you know, that frustration, and we sense it in marriage, you sense it in job, you know, you have to stop long and say, why am I so upset? Why am I so frustrated? Why am I so angry with her? Why am I so mad at him? What's going on here? Are you willing to ask those kind of questions? Then you can begin to discover that Jesus Christ is the living water of life, and he will come into you and flow through you with his substance. But if, you get, if you're just thinking everybody else is going to have to do just right to make you happy, you're in for a world of hurt and a world of misery. And your life's never going to find or come to any place of satisfaction no matter who you marry or how much money you get or how good your health is. See, so if you just get a grip on this little simple message that Jesus Christ is the only one, anything else is not going to work. When you trust in God, these are the results. Your inner security, your strength are dependent upon Him. And He is faithful and He has unlimited resources. You can trust in God. You're going to discover that He is able. Your ability now to be the lover, to be the giver, will flow from an inner resource available to you at all times, and that all times is the Holy Spirit. So when you, others are not giving to you, you can still love them generously. When others are not giving to you, you can still be what God's called you to be. You can literally endear people to yourselves this way. Well, you're not waiting for them to act in a certain way. You can initiate life you can initiate grace. You can initiate forgiveness. You can initiate acceptance because you have all that in your life. It's easy to forgive somebody their failures when you realize, hey, I was the absolute biggest failure. Isn't it amazing? Every one of us today, if we just get honest, you know, we're so afraid of that. But, you know, God does know everything about you. God knows every secret little dirty thing about us. Everything. Everything you've said about others, everything you've done behind doors, everything you've done in the dark, everything you've said in secret, every dirty thought, everything. There's not a thing God doesn't know about. And He loves us. And He receives us. And He accepts us. And He forgives us. And He blesses us. And He calls us to His side. And calls us friend. And when you discover that, that you're accepted in Him. You can quit performing for Him and enjoy Him. You quit being afraid of Him and walk in a new kind of reverential awe and respect of Him. And you can have liberty in your spiritual walk in life that you hadn't discovered anymore. And now you'll be strengthened in your life. And now you're filled with the new attitude that out of your life is, there emanates this freedom that other people, I believe, are, are drawn to this, this atmosphere of, of blessing, of grace, of faith, of, 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 of optimism. But it's not like just be happy optimism like you get in a lot of churches, a little devotion, so to speak. But this is a holy optimism. I believe that all things work together for good to them that are called of God and that love God. That righteous optimism that knows that God is in charge and it doesn't matter how much hell breaks loose, heaven's going to break loose in the middle of it all. And your expectation of others now draws you closer with them because now, instead of having to get something from them, you're able to love and you're able to give them of yourself. And what you give is not based upon what they're doing or they're not doing. This is transforming. This is life-altering. This is life-changing. I'm reading a great book that kind of goes along with a particular study we're in here and even gets into some of the book we're doing in Lift Group with our grace study. But it's uh, written by uh, Tulian Chichivan. Tulian is a pastor in Florida. He took Dr. D. James Kennedy's place when he passed away at Coal Ridge Presbyterian Church. He said when he started that church, a, a, another church down the road from Coal Ridge, it was going well, it was thriving, and then Dr. Kennedy passed away and they wanted to join the two churches together. And we know what that's like. Uh, when the two congregated together, how much of a conflict that he went through, and where he said, I had to learn this lesson that it's Jesus, and that's all I really need. Because there was rejection and disappointments and different ideas, and per everybody has different perception of things, and everybody thinks somebody else has got an ultimate alter motive going on. He says, you know, and here's the, here's the title of the book, which I, I'll just give you the title, because it surmises, it summarizes everything that he experienced, but everything I'm trying to say today is this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But we think, no, it's Jesus plus a better acting husband or just a husband equals everything. Jesus plus a better job equals everything. Jesus plus acceptance from my peers at work equals everything. Jesus plus a pay raise equals everything. Jesus plus, you know, status in my church equals everything. Jesus plus a bigger church equals everything. No. Jesus plus what? Nothing. 
Jesus plus what? Equals? Because he is everything. He's everything I need. And again, I reiterate the fact that this is not some kind of uh, religious, you know, combination of psychobabble and stuff. This is reality. Some people have asked Kathy and I many times how come our marriage is, is it works. It's not because we don't fuss. We fuss. She, she did some stupid stuff. <laughs> I do some stupid stuff. I mean, we're people. We're failed. We just, you know, we're going to do that. It's just part of, the, part of the gig, folks. I mean, your pastor's not perfect, but neither are you, so let's chill. <laughs> All right? And we get, you know, if I, it's usually about something stupid, you know, get a little twisted and turned out. But we, we, don't, we don't lose it. We don't lose our commitment to each other because our satisfaction comes from a deeper well. It comes from a deeper source. And that's it's got to be that way in every one of our lives and every one in our marriages. That we've, When you discover that the Bible that was written thousands of years ago, still the words are still true and still relevant and still life-giving and still transforming. If we believe what God has said in His Word, we won't have a marriage on the rocks. We'll have a marriage on the rock. And you just need to get a grip on the fact that when Jesus said He loves you and He died because He loves you, that's a truth and that's a reality. He really does. And He's not waiting for you to perform in such a way, in such a way for you to, to love you. He loves you as you are. He, yes, he wants to transform your life, and yes, he wants to make you more like his son. We talked about that last week in grieving the Holy Spirit, why we don't need to, because it's his ministry to transform us into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can trust in the Lord Jesus. He is there, and he's available to you, and he is life, he is bread, and he is spiritual water to you. He can satisfy the hunger of your heart, no matter what that hunger is. He can meet the need in your life. And if you'll transfer your expectations in your life, Offer your husband, your spouse, your parents, whatever it might be, and transfer them onto the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to discover some marvelous things, and you're going to discover he loved you more than you ever thought you could ever be loved by anyone. And he, he has the capacity that, and he wants to meet the needs in your life more than anyone has ever wanted to meet in your life. He knows what your needs are, and he seeks to meet those needs. And for the sake of your life and the lives of those around you, trust Jesus to meet your needs. It's only the person who's genuinely trusting the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. It's only that person who's going to experience a successful life, genuinely successful. You know, as well as I do, the stories of millionaires who kill themselves, who are empty, have come to a place in their life, they have so many things and nothing has satisfied them. Disillusioned with life. A lot of people, maybe you're in this room and you're disillusioned with your marriage or you're disillusioned with your life, your relationships, with your spouse in particular. Let me ask you, are you regularly disappointed because you don't experience inner joy, inner peace, and the inner fulfillment that you desire? And have you reached a point where you wonder if your marriage can even work again? Maybe you need to come back to the place, if you're answering yes, to realize that you've been looking for someone else to meet the needs that only God can meet in your life. And you need to turn to Him, and you need to trust Him. And you understand this principle, you see how all these other things having a preeminence in our life, how that becomes idolatry, idol worship. God said, there'll be no other gods before me. Put down those idols. I want to close with these two passages from Galatians, little sections. It says, the deeds of the flesh are evident. It's what comes from trusting yourself or others to meet your needs. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envies, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's, that's the fruit that comes off a tree that doesn't have the real life flowing through it. But when you take the contrast of that and just read the next two verses from Galatians 5, it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. In other words, if you're looking for other things to meet your needs, it's only going to lead to all the stuff we just mentioned prior. But if you're looking to God to meet your needs, out of that will flow life and joy and peace and substance and strength and power and grace, kindness and joy, the way you feel inside and the way you act outside will all be changed. 
Could it be that you've looked to the wrong things? The source of fulfillment for the deepest needs in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. The source of fulfillment, let me apply it to an application of your marriage. The source of fulfillment in your marriage is seeking Jesus Christ to meet the deepest needs of your heart and life. The source of fulfillment in your single life as a single person is looking to Jesus Christ to meet the deepest needs of your life. If you walk out of here and you've got that written down in your heart and mind, and you don't forget it, you're going to have a full and complete life. Not based upon my word, but based upon the words of this book. I hope that's been the decision of your heart. And if you're like me as a Christian, you have to be often reminded to tear down the idols. Tear down the idols. Quit looking for things and circumstances to be what you need to find fulfillment. It's going to be found in Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I would say today, first and foremost, if you do not know Jesus Christ,